Yeah, that's it. We are recording. So we've met a couple of, a couple of years ago now at a convention, uh, didn't we? Uh, it was the Retroware. Retro World Expo. Retro World Expo, Expo that's you. right. And um, and the, the, I, I love, well, I love conventions. The problem I have with a, that sort of environment is that it's very hard to get to talk to somebody properly. Uh, there's always loads of people I'd love to talk to and I'd love to spend time uh, talking to. But unfortunately, just too many distractions, too many uh, people around and all that. But I was very intrigued uh, by uh, by what you do um, or um, what your description is on Twitter anyway. Um, uh, you're a, a gaming professor, is that it? Yep, that's uh, that's one of my three jobs, yes. What, what is that? I'd, I'd love to know. Because I come from a time when there was none of that and there seems to be tons sure. of, uh, of academia available now for video games. So yeah. what is a gaming professor? So we have a school of computer game design at George Mason University, and I'm an adjunct professor um, in the faculty there. And our major is designed to get students from a variety of different backgrounds, art, music, animation, design, programming, and so uh, It's a bachelor's of arts program. We have a minor, a major, and a master's program as well. Wow. Um, I actually, my background is in computer science. I'm a programmer by trade, but I came back to the university after graduating uh, to get the master's in game design and actually kind of followed that through directly into teaching. So, so what is it? Do you teach what exactly nowadays then? Uh, I started with a combination of game history and then basic game design. Uh, it's 210 in our catalog, which is sort of a combination of understanding concepts and getting some practical experience. So the students will work in things like Game Maker or Construct, um, kind of get their feet under them before they move on to more complicated engine. Wow. And is it, do you, is it like, do you have to be a student there? Do you have to have some proficiency already in, in programming or design? Or is it learning all that through the medium of gaming? Um, so we get a lot. I mean, we have some students who come in with, you know, they've been doing this for years. It's a passion of theirs and they wanted to kind of formalize it. And then we also get students who know they want to do it, but have never really taken that first step, never tried to tackle actually making games. And so, uh, Obviously, we have to be set up to kind of accommodate students of various skill levels like any institution yeah. would be. Um, but yeah, no, we, we probably, I would say more students than not have at least tried on their own by the time they get to uh, to university. Uh, and what, what like do people then end up then, is the idea for them obviously to work in video game design or for, for companies or indie stuff or? Yeah, so we actually, it's interesting. We have students, um, that take two kind of divergent paths. We do have students that end up going into industry. Um, we are just now setting up our alumni association, so I don't have examples to give you here. We're hoping to have them by the end of the year. We can start tracking down who's where. Um, but that'd be we interesting, also, actually. That'd be super interesting to it, follow. It really is, and it's great for us, not just so we know where yeah. they're going, but yeah. they can kind of give us feedback about what did they get from us that was helpful and what did they need to have so that we can kind of adjust for the next set of kids coming in. Exactly, because it's easy to have a flat program, if, you know, that you don't know whether it, it works enough for them but like if you know that you've done that and all these people have have gone on to you know doing uh, grand things but it, it's it's you can then tailor obviously your your cur uh, curriculum f um they, that's that'd be super interesting actually yeah. and, and we kind of have to um game design isn't history it's not math this stuff is state of the art it's constantly changing and so obviously we have to be able to react as you know it, you know, the corporate world reacts as the, the game world reacts. You know, when VR came out, you have to be able to start teaching students how to develop for that. When mobile becomes big, you have to be able to start teaching students to develop for that. You know, yeah. you have to be reactive to the sphere as it were. This is sort of in, well, it's, I suppose it's the same for any development. I mean, I, I work in development as well. It's just, you, you can't, it's like any science, I suppose. You can't afford to just stay on, 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 on your basis knowledge. You, you, you need to, change and learn and, and you know do more and more tutorials new technology and then go to seminars and all that kind of stuff it just it's constantly evolving it's it's going super fast as well that's the scary part how like how do you stay in touch with everything yourself um i'm from personal standpoint so part of it is you have to do your own study you have to yeah. spend some time you know following on to people um 
you have to remember you're always a student even when you're a teacher you are constantly learning so you're doing some of this yourself um you do some practical development of your own obviously uh we had a professor a couple years back that actually was one of our vr specialists went out to a convention in california uh won a prize at a major competition out there and now he's actually developing and so we lost him on the faculty but um you know we we are always kind of um cycling as we deal with that um and then honestly it, it doesn't hurt to read or to yeah. in the case of games play i mean the, getting firsthand experience with you know the whatever's coming out you know it's it's a good excuse right uh, yeah you, yeah dream job is it <laughs> you have to play to uh yeah twist my arm <laughs> yeah <laughs> Do you get to play much though? Um, play, play, play for yourself, or does it then become part work, part play? Like where you have to keep a critical eye for new stuff, or, or that's that's probably it. I mean, I do get time to play games, um, not just for the channel, but also just kind of on my own. Um, but admittedly, um, it's hard to turn that part of your brain off, right? You're you're playing. So, like, I've been playing Tetris Effect the last couple of days. And I find myself sitting there like wondering like, oh, well, they did this for that particle effect or, you know, that's interesting that it reacts to this part of the waveform, the music or, you know, different actions. And so you can start kind of piecing together, you know, little parts of that and your brain is kind of always in that developer mode yeah. and it makes it a little harder to turn off. Yeah, I find I find as well whenever I, I use any piece of software or anything like that, I get I get very not critical because most of the time I don't think I could do better, but I, I'm always going or they must have done it like this you know if, to get that sort of effect or to get that you know whatever the object yeah just yeah you, you have a tendency to do i suppose it's a, a job I, uh, yeah it's i guess that's a different one between like criticism and critique if you want to yeah. kind of have some news right it's the difference between trying to pick apart how they did something versus you know having a particular weighted opinion how, how long have you been doing this then Uh, so I've been associated with George Mason University since 1999, although I've only been on faculty since 2016. Um, they're going to drag me out of college kicking and screaming. <laughs> I will, I'll be 120. Like it, yeah. but I really do. Um, I actually, um, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, school in the United States, but we have like elementary, middle, high school, and then college. Um, I dropped out of high school because I was bored of it and just mm -hmm. went to the university and asked if I could start taking classes there instead. So yeah, I've been in college since I was 15 and I'm yeah. 34 now. So, Oh, oh sorry. I thought we got this kind of, it's, um, I, it's funny. Like I was never big into my studies either when I was, when I was younger. Uh, not that I didn't want to learn, like I've, I've always, I'm still, like you said, I'm still a student of sort. It's just I keep learning new stuff and new yeah, new languages or new, in my case, music or pieces. But it's just, it's you get that drive of just learning. And I, I've, I've found back then that school just wasn't exactly uh, appropriate for me or for the way I was learning anyway. Sure. But it's interesting that having dropped out, you wanted to go back to a... Uh, academia anyway it's just uh um my uh i have my my brother-in-law is like that actually he was told that you never amount too much and now he's the principal of the school <laughs> and he dropped out he left like he had to uh, do his uh his leaving cert or what was it i don't know what it is now but it's when you're a teenager it's a big exam but he had to go back and redo it in his uh, later years in his 20s and I'm ended sure. up uh, being the yeah he's the principal of the, uh, the school he was at first yeah now in your case i know you obviously you're known for the music stuff but um i've been also you do a lot of like painting artwork like i haven't done that recently because i know you have a lot of it like in your older oh, posts, yeah. older listing like a lot of the paint no i go through i go through phases i go through phases like i can't i have a problem with discipline or getting a proper routine for stuff so i have a routine for a ton of stuff you see the oscilloscope there i have a workbench set up for repairs and all this kind of stuff and then i have a setup here for painting so i just i don't know every every six months i get to a whole month of just doing nothing but painting and then for a while it's music for a while it's just fixing arcade boards and sure uh, 
something else you know? <laughs> well i i mention it because um we're uh, you know there's sort of so many different elements when it comes to game development right there's mm -hmm. music there's art there's animation there's brain there's so many different disciplines um and our students have to tackle a number of them like at some point you get to specialize you get to pick what your specific track is but there's enough in the major that they really have to tackle a lot of different things so it does take a certain creative mind to you know to approach this um this industry yeah. and yeah. as somebody you know you understand so like as anyone you can do something really well and not be motivated to do it you can do something you know dc extremely excited to do it and we're always kind of balancing that student desire to learn that desire to kind of attack and, and approach stuff versus um ability because ability we have to kind of level out where they are and what they need to know but um you know there's no substitute for motivation no it's it's interesting what you say because I've, I've seen a lot of people who are incredibly talented for either drawing or music and i'm, I'm always going why are you not exploiting it or using it you know this i, I know a lot of people who, who are, are far better at, at their instrument or my own instrument than I am and uh, and they don't seem to have that drive to uh, to uh, explore and, and, and use it or the same enjoyment I get it's interesting but they get super excited about something else like if it, they might be very good musicians but they, they just love drawing or painting for some reason and they spend all their time and effort in that and might not be where they shine the most but I suppose over time they, they eventually do it's it's interesting um, It, it must. I, do you tear your, your your hair like sometimes looking at some students going? Well, I must have. <laughs> But uh, do you, is it is it hard some, sometimes to see a few students? You know, you know they're very talented here, but it's not their area of focus. Like, do you kind of try to push them in that yeah. direction? Yeah. So you just, so you can't force them to do something they don't want to do, obviously. But I think. Um, And this is something that goes a little unmentioned. Uh, when you play games, you can get achievements, right? So let's say you're just playing the latest AAA game. You get an achievement for killing the first boss. It's not really an achievement per se, right? It's like, well, just about everyone's going to get this far. Um, but that positive reinforcement, that that message that you're sort of on the right track and you're doing something that's you know valuable or has some sort of merit to it, um, that doesn't get leveraged enough i think in academia i think we we tend to grade things we tell people how good they are at a thing but we we don't institutionalize telling people that the thing they're like they're on the right track the mm. things that they are doing are yeah. good or useful and i find a lot of that's got to come through like manual student feedback so i've got to sit and talk with them i have to sort of see their process at work um as i'm grading through their projects and their papers it's it's the difference between giving something an a or a b or taking a paragraph or two to really talk about the work and dig into it and i mean that's where i really see that the difference is if you can get there and actually get a conversation going with the student um i try to get a little socratic when we're doing lectures because i can take a book and i can read to them and they can go back and read that book or whatever but if there isn't some sort of you know engagement or dialogue it's not going to stick nearly as well um i don't know if you're familiar with tristan donovan no Okay, so Tristan Donovan is an, an author um, that I'm particularly fond of using um, for classes. Uh, two books he did. One is um, Replay, which is sort of a history of video games from the Festival of Britain in 1951 to about the end of the 20th century. Okay. But it's not written like a textbook. There aren't pictures and little like, here's what you need to know about 1985. You know, um, New York release of the nes super mario brothers blah, blah, blah. Yeah. you know it's not a bullet list it's he writes it you know sort of in a story format and you're getting this through you know what was happening at nutting and associates what was nolan bushnell going through what was you know ralph bear dealing with um what happened when uh you know ces was going down in 86 like all these little yeah, okay. historical points and by forcing students to kind of get immersed in that sort of story style story perspective um it's more conversational and i think it's more useful um i am purely coincidentally wearing norm's t-shirt today and i think that's kind of what makes his particular product effective is that he manages to make sort of this ken burn style conversational um form yeah. from his points yeah the, the, i think that's the thing that a lot of people like about what he does i suppose it just it contextualizes everything you know it doesn't just give you a fact or an event like there's always a context behind it and i like the fact that 
Yeah, and it's probably his background as well, um, having an interest in, in history in general. But it, 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 gives, it always gives you the context for any event that happens. It's, and it's super important, especially when you're, you're talking about retro gaming, because it's still technically a very, very novel medium as far as art is concerned. And, uh, and there's nothing objective really about it, you know, um, at, at this, still at this point, especially when you're looking into retro gaming so much uh, so much um, nostalgia attached to it so it's super important to contextualize everything as well yeah and it's tricky um, we have and this is something um, I dig into a lot from a pedagogical perspective we have our generation um, the, this weird relationship where we grew up with the medium yeah. and what we're getting now are the, you know the first and second wave of students who um, grew up with stuff that existed, you know, prior to their their use case. Yeah. So um, this goes as much for games as anything else. But for games, you know, all students will say, "Yeah, my first system was a PlayStation Three. The first game I ever really enjoyed playing was Uncharted." And and it's yeah. it, you know, besides hurting your heart a little bit, just because, yeah, I'm I'm going to be in the ground in a week. Um, <laughs> it, it's also helpful because it's like, oh well then there are a lot of really important things that go into understanding how certain tricks of memory work and how older languages work and how um, we did things in 2D or how we kind of faked 3D and then we got into, you know, early, like they need to be walked through that. And you can curate a list of stuff for them to do, um, but at the end of the day, it's about making sure that you can catch them up to the necessary historical context of see why the things that are happening now matter and more important where things need to be going um but we see this in other places too so we a lot of us also grew up with keyboards and mice in our homes and we're now getting a generation of students who are growing up with tablets yeah. and while the tablet is a far more powerful device it's largely a consumer device it's not as big a creator device as it is and so you know, we were seeing words per minute from students going, you know, skyrocketing uh, through the 80s and the 90s because everyone now had keyboards and mice in their home and they were growing up on the computer and games were on the computer, so they were drawn to it. But it also improved their sort of productivity skills, things they can take to the workplace just as a nice consequence of that. Well, that's starting to level out and actually drop a bit because those same young people that were using those productivity devices as a circumstance of entertainment aren't anymore and until we either find a way to make tablets um more productive and use them in the workplace more efficiently or um try to find a way to pivot from an academic perspective to get keyboards back into the hands of students um that's a skill set that's actually a little bit in decline that's very true that's interesting actually something i never th reflected on although th there was i mean there's th there was always consoles it wasn't necessarily always keyboards attached to your gaming device yeah uh, no it's I, that's true but i see what you there was yeah if chances are if you had a console there was probably a computer in the house somewhere anyway um and it's true that the tablet yeah there was always a pc i suppose uh, even in, in later years but yeah i suppose the tablet is taking away all that sort of mechanical interaction that well it's also actually in the school skills yeah you know, like the elementary schools now are, are giving students tablets instead of PCs because yeah. they're smaller, they're cheaper, they're easily, more easily replaced. And a lot of the educational software that's being made is being made for tablets. Um, so you are sort of seeing that, that it's as much the home as it is the, uh, the school. The uh, mobile devices were on the forefront recently of <laughs> a big gaming announcement with the Diablo. Have you been following that at all? I've just seen a few videos. I, I have to to an extent, and my opinion of this thing is I've always felt, um, I don't know if bad's the right word, but I always feel like creators, especially creators that work for publicly traded companies, you're kind of stuck. And I say that in the sense that when we think of movies, nobody bats an eye when somebody makes sort of a brainless summer blockbuster because they know it's going to make a lot of money. And that money is what the studio needs to then turn around and make the art house film that's going to go win something it can, right? Um, Sony Pictures does some amazing um, work with like documentaries and stuff, but if they weren't making money on the summer blockbusters and the stuff that yeah, you know yeah. brings audiences in, then they don't have the money to go do that other yeah. thing. You know, Activision 
paid a ton of money to, to acquire King. And they did that for a reason, right? The, the mobile stuff just makes ridiculous amounts of money. In, and in so it's much larger, bigger, because we're talking about the Western market here, but right. the, the Asian market yeah. is already far ahead of us for mobile gaming. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tencent is killing everybody right now and, and with good cause. And it's I guess it's understandable when maybe I guess the best um, devil's advocate case can make here is if BlizzCon is supposed to be sort of like this is an event that we're bringing you know, let's stick with our movie analogy. If this is a high society event, we're bringing in all these documentary fans and we show them a clip from like, oh, here's an upcoming project we have going and it's it's a summer blockbuster. You know, it's it's not a bad idea and it's certainly a, you know, an obvious decision from a corporate perspective, but maybe it's, you know, tone deaf to the audience uh, there in question. Not yeah. to say that the audience's behavior was necessarily all that, you know, pleasant either, but um, although it's funny, um, uh, ancillary sort of uh, side of this is I am writing for um, Pat Country's new SNES book right now. And so obviously, um, whether intentional or not, it's it's been funny to see him kind of, I guess, caught up in the center of all this. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he really got caught up in it. Um, I, look at, I mean, it, it's, it's the type of topic that is going to be divisive regardless of what side you, you stand on. Um, maybe Pat could have handled it a bit more smoothly, but that's just the way it happened. So, um, yeah, it was interesting to watch. I think there's a, a clear disconnect with the reality of the gaming market in general, at least for us in the West, uh, as you know, we're, we're expecting sort of old fashioned AAA type of games, but these cost so much money nowadays and the expectations are so high. So it's sort of inevitable that a, a lot of <clears throat> A lot of uh, studios like that have to look at the, uh, the the mobile platform to make faster, quicker games. It's, it's some quick, cash so they yeah. can actually bring us the AAA uh, game. It's quicker, and it's frankly, it's a little more stable. Yeah. Everyone was talking about Red Dead Redemption 2 in two kind of different tracks, right? We had the one track of unbelievable look how much detail game of the year right and the other track nice. which you know some <laughs> yeah well and the other track was the the horror stories that were coming out of rockstar yeah you know in the process of developing this stuff and we always talk about cost benefit analysis right the the idea that you have to weigh all the the risks and all the issues that, that go in with um developing any product and then compare that against you know the potential outcome and the benefit and I want to say Polygon wrote this, and I'm not positive, but there was a really interesting take about, you know, where does the diminishing returns start to kick in? At what point does the game that costs 600 million to make, you know, 800 million to make the first game that costs, you know, a billion, two billion, whatever it is to actually develop, you know, at what point is a game so outlandishly, um, um, you know, omnipotent in its development that it can no longer, like, no economic model is going to sustain it. Yeah. And if you're just running a simple cost benefit analysis, would you really try to hire 3,000 artists, animators, developers, quality assurance staff, you know, producers, licensees, et cetera, to do a game of that scope when you can break them off into 10 teams, each of which have, you know, two to 10 times more likelihood of being profitable for their own particular sector or market? And, uh, you know, I get the sense that we are close to a, a breaking point on that because I don't think there's too many studios that can do, you know, what, um, you know, a take to Rockstar, Activision, Blizzard, EA, you know, there's only so many places where you can assemble a, a staff of that scope and, and undergo an effort of this size um, before we're going to kind of hit a, a critical wall there. <clears throat> do, do you think they've sort of uh, backed themselves into a corner then in a way? By, by producing um, in, at least or mid, mid mid 2000s early 2000s but it is a lot of very very high quality games that's when we we saw, sort of saw the rise of just high production values on games and do you think that's I mean is it sustainable that sort well, of well it's yeah it's tricky um, on the one hand there's always going to be somebody chasing, you know, cutting edge, right? Like anything else with music, with movies, with games, you're always going to have somebody who's trying to figure out what it, whatever's the latest technical hurdle they can accomplish. What's sort of pushing the goalposts out that much farther. 
Um, obviously, there's additional cost and factors that go into that. Um, I think what it really comes down to is can technology, as we develop it, keep up with um, our desire to develop content? Uh, we've had some interesting products uh, come through the university. We had one of our professors was developing a way to procedurally screen content. Like, let's say you created a house in a 3D engine, and your house is very specific and it's tailored um, and it looks nice, but you need to put it in an environment and you don't have the time necessarily to develop the environment around the house. So put the house down in 3D space, procedurally generate terrain around it, you know, just hit the randomizer button until you get something you roughly like, save that, bake that in. Now you have a larger snippet. You can take that out, you know, export that. It does all the interconnecting of the mesh automatically, then get to a larger space, you know. So if you can sort of hand wave, um, the tedium of developing the stuff outside of the most important content, but then you still have sort of this authorial intent, you know, some creative mm -hmm. control because you're looking to see what the procedural generator comes up with, sort of sign off on it, stitch it automatically to the rest of the train. You can start building, you know, towns and then surrounding wilderness like a lot quicker. Um, and that's gonna be, I guess, the, the $64,000 question, right? Can we, do the tools that allow us to build this stuff more and more efficiently um, keep up with the scope of the games as the games get more and more complicated? The uh, the procedural generation tools actually have gone. I mean, it's amazing. Some you know what they can actually produce now. This in actually very little time. You know, all things considered, um, is it a, is it a big part now of uh, game design? Is is a lot is a lot of it procedurally generated? Like if you look at um, I don't know. Yeah, Red Dead Redemption or uh, these type of games. Like, is that to an extent? I think um, a lot of it is um, content generation. Is a combination of you have uh, art, animation, rigging, right? Sort of that pipeline for creating actors and assets, and that team's always going to be trying to create as many things that are usable. Mm by your designers as possible you have your design pipeline which is people that might be developing levels might be making quests objectives kind of stitching the game together essentially they're also likely working on your rules your numeric stuff like how much should this hit for how much damage should you take when you run into a brick wall and so forth um you've got you know your your audio team your qa team um and obviously you have producers who are trying to stitch this together in some nightmare of a gantt chart um but um, there's a reason, you know, that the, the art teams are as large as they are now in these projects is because it's just taking up a larger and larger percentage of the project. Um, I mean, you can just look at the visual, you know, the vistas yeah. are stunning. The characters are stunning. Like it's, it's unreal what we're producing now. Yeah. Um, you know, literally and figuratively the unreal engine just does some amazing, you know, technical out of the box stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, there's, there's certainly an argument to be made that um, you're going to have uh, people kind of running into each other or kind of running into a head trying to develop stuff. But um, it's just really a matter of how ambitious your game is. And I think there's a reason Red Dead Redemption 2 ran into as many, like, you know, issues with people working as hard as they were working for as long as they were. Um, you can see it in the little details, right? You can make a game of that visual acuity, but when you start looking at all the little, the hand details, the stuff that obviously yeah, had to yeah. take time from somebody working, you know, that isn't just coming out of like clicking a button in the engine, having it pre-gen something, picking a good spot for it on the map and moving on. Um, you can generate worlds of that size real quick and real easy. Um, World War II Online years and years and years ago was a i think a one to two scale of western europe but there was almost nothing in the game right like it was it was you know basically what does a generic um a sort of field look like um drop a couple random homes drop a couple random like uh hedgerows a couple stone fences call it a day um whereas you know something of this complexity where it's so much handcrafted stuff is going to take you know just orders of magnitude longer yeah yeah my my mind just exploded because <laughs> it's just when I, I remember when i was a, a kid i was just fascinated by the 
the fact that you could actually just program a game you could you could program a world you know that's what actually got me into into programming um I, and i i don't know if that's the case for you um you know um, but my uh, goal was always to sort of make a game which i never really materialized but once yeah. i found out how a lot of things were made and were constructed there was a, a certain i suppose it's the same for music when once you 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 break apart all the uh, elements that make the uh, the uh, the whole piece magical and uh, suddenly uh, there's a certain part of a of you is sort of, sort of disenchanted and i sort of lost interest in in the making of video well, of me ever getting involved in making a video game but i'm still always fascinated by uh, by the dedication that a lot of these people uh, put into it you, you mentioned red dead redemption 2 like red dead redemption 1 was equally problematic for the team oh, I mean, they, sure. they, there was a human cost attached to that uh, and it's a recurring theme in game design in general um, the, 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 the pressure put on the developer by both the gamers themselves because they're usually the ones they like to blame but also by the the, 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 the management um, like it's notoriously known for putting crunch time pretty much you know for the whole direction of the project life cycle like what well, yeah. how do you deal with that in in the school in the college sorry. um well is that a topic you bring up yeah we do we have a couple different courses we have we you know we teach them project management we go through an entrepreneurial class so they have a little understanding of how to deal with valuations and sort of the economic side of game development um but yeah um any college student will tell you that they're under something equivalent to crunch during finals week um, obviously it's a much smaller scale yeah. version of something like that and it's not specific to what we're doing um, you know, they've got our final to work on. They've got a Calc final to, you know, study for. They've got a, a History of Western Civ final and so on and so forth. Um, but we will oftentimes try to get them comfortable with as many elements of um, sort of the corporate environment as possible, right? So we it's obviously team projects is something you got to get used to as soon as possible. So we've got them as early as game 210 making, you know, projects in teams. Um, sort of getting comfortable with uh, version tracking and issue tracking, um, explain how to use, you know, sort of uh, version control systems. Uh, it's funny though, this actually ties a little bit into my, my other job, um, my other paying job That's anyway. You, you've you've um, three jobs, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, so my, my main nine to five is I'm, um, I'm a programmer for the federal government. So I've worked for uh, the Department of Justice, Health and Human Services, the US Postal Service and so forth. And so I've had to develop a lot of different solutions for a lot of, you know, kind of oddball issues for you know, a lot of different things. And we have a lot of students uh, at George Mason who actually go to work because where we're, we're here in Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington DC is kind of a, it's a tech haven. There's a lot of companies out here that do, you know, contract work for the government. Yeah. And so we have a lot of students go into serious games. You know, we've had students develop simulators to learn how to fly UAVs and drones. We've had students develop training simulators for fire departments so that they could practice um, dealing with backdraft and clearing, you know, rooms and looking for survivors and getting practice with all that before they actually have to go do a literal and figurative fire exercise, you know. We've had students work on VR stuff for the State Department so that people who are going to go work at an embassy somewhere actually have a chance to kind of learn the layout of the embassy and walk around and learn some of the normal procedures. Like, let's, you know, take, for example, uh, somebody gets sent to... Um, you know, the other side of the world, you know, Jakarta, yeah, out of nowhere. And they're at that embassy. And the second day they're at the embassy, um, you know, just some, even if the kitchen catches on fire or something, right? Do they know how to get to the emergency exits? Mm -hmm. Do they know how to make, like, what is their response? And they've literally only been there a day. Um, but this gives them sort of the necessary training to be ready to, you know, um, to deal with it, whatever you know situation arises uh, when they're there because you've kind of given them that that advanced training um so we've got students that kind of go down that route and make stuff like that um and that's not uncommon um but there are different demands that, that go into that kind of thing right it's not the same environment it's it's not the same type of contract um a lot of them are working for companies who are then working for um either another company or for the government 
permit and because it's different because the the business um pattern there is so different we try to make sure that our students have i guess enough breadth of experience to be able to deal with you know wherever they end up um whether it's working in the commercial sphere or the public sector do you do you see you mentioned vr do you do you see a future in vr in that field i've, I've never been totally impressed by vr as a gaming device i just find it very cumbersome in general yeah uh, so maybe we're... it's my age first because i i didn't grow up with it so i'm wondering where there are kids that are born with it will actually adopt it very um soon. i th i think where the age gap makes the biggest difference is the ability to assimilate to the tech and not get like motion sickness from it necessarily because mm -hmm. the younger you get accustomed to it you know it does help where vr is currently hurting right now is applications that are asking the user to suspend disbelief that their body is in motion yeah right because it can do an effective job of shutting you out from the real world right we can use noise canceling we can use surround audio we can use high def visuals with a shutter and make you feel like you are sitting anywhere really sitting anywhere um what we can't necessarily do is make you feel like you can get up and move around where you are um, we're still using like motion capture or sticks or camera arrays to handle that, but you can still kind of get a sense you're in the, the real world and not this, you know, kind of transported feeling. So some of those simulators have been more effective than others. The, um, the stuff that allows you to kind of be somewhere is the, I think, um, the biggest one. The one that I expect to actually have the most commercial success in the near future isn't really game-based um it's sort of a it's a television thing so consuming say uh you want to watch the lakers play the celtics right you can go to the arena pay a few hundred dollars but the seats sell out the season tickets are very expensive it's difficult to maybe get into that arena maybe you're in another country you don't have an opportunity to get out there you know it's prohibitively expensive or there's just no time available you know what if you pay 50 or 75 dollars for a virtual courtside seat right you set a camera up right there you know a 360 degree rotational camera set up courtside you can actually look left and right and see you know in you know 4k 60 frames per second super high fidelity with the exact sound and exact appearance of exactly what's going on there at that time um, because as the world gets more and more populated and as it becomes more and more expensive and more and more difficult to go to live events the ability to virtually attend live events i think is somewhere you're going to see the vr sphere pick up big time you know courtside uh, seats for fights concerts yeah um even, you know even something like um i don't know if you know the, the corpse flower that bloomed recently in amazon in seattle no so i, I maybe wrong because i think it's only like once every 17 years or so that this plant actually um you know kind of opens up and, and germinates and so oh, wow. it was kind of this big exciting event um we actually got the chance to go out there but we missed it by like two days and when we got there they had this big camera array set up around the thing and the only thing i was thinking is like wow they probably had thousands of people watching live as the thing actually opened up and there is this sense of um virtual tourism or virtual attendance that I think is going to take off for VR because it doesn't require that sense of, of motion mm. uh, that comes along with it. I think until you get something more akin to um, tactical uh, or biofeedback, you know, suits, pressure, um, something that's actually giving your body resistance, um, that the sort of spectator side of VR is going to be the first one that catches on commercially. That's always my, my problem I've had with stuff like VR. It's not a problem, I suppose, but it's just, it, it does require an initial investment. It's still sort of expensive and uh, extra setup um, for, for the casual user, I find. But I, I've wondered like for, for things like training or in-situ training, like you mentioned, you know, in embassies or, or you know, whatever, or for virtual tourism, um, to actually get a sense of the place before you actually get there or to check whether that's where you want to go in the first place um yeah i, th I think there's there's probably a it's got to be an emerging market there i don't think for gaming that it's i don't know maybe again maybe it's a generation generational thing i i i, I don't know i'm not convinced yet and the technology we'll, is we'll get there very good i still yeah i, I don't yeah. know it, it's hard to say 
Um, it's still very expensive, though, I, I find. Mind you, yeah. if you can put 400 euros or dollars into a, a console, <laughs> what's the next I, I'm, And especially right now when people are, you know, you're already carrying this five, seven, nine hundred dollar phone in your pocket, and most people are using it as their own. I mean, again, there's a reason mobile games are taking off the way they are because everyone's, you know, it's uh, the VR tech is far from ubiquitous right now. It's going to take a long time to kind of get to that. Do you know how much point. of a difference? Like, is it is is the mobile market like so much bigger than the the console or computer market? I don't have numbers on me now, but we generally assume that the the mobile market is at least one to two orders of magnitude bigger than really any other game in. Um, you know, if you just think about the the number of people who own um, a computer in their house that is capable of playing, you know, that is of sufficient rigor to play a game that's come out in the last few years, versus um, people who own you know a tablet or cell phone. Um, or people that have a modern console versus, you know, a cell phone. And then the numbers are staggering in favor of mobile phones. And so there's, I mean, there's a reason. You have a captive audience of billions, you know, with these devices. Um, there, it's a much larger target market. Uh, it's just as, 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 as consumers of video games and consoles and computers we in the west we've a tendency to think that our devices are the, uh, the we're the, we're the real gamer with the the most pop you know the, the, we're, we're, you, we're the most numerous type of gamers and uh, the most on the most popular platforms it's not quite so i remember going to a a talk done by uh, brenda romero who is now uh, john romero and, and brenda romero are in galway now not far from where no, I am. Yeah, that's right. They are. And uh, they were doing a talk. And uh, at the time, she was saying that the the, mo the, the biggest um, gamer in the West um, was a couple of years ago was the 40-year-old uh, mother uh, on her mobile phone. Uh, my wife was like, well, that's not possible. I was like, well, do you play video games? She said, no, no, I don't play any video games. So I said, well, what do you have on your phone? And she had stuff like the room, you know, and solitaire and all these kind of stuff. Um, but this, this is the type of market we're talking about. All these yeah. sort of mobile, casual mobile apps. And, and that's right. We talk about this sort of people who have some sort of identity based in gaming. And inherently, that always kind of goes down to consoles or PC gaming or, or something along those lines, right? It never you never see that association really in the mobile uh, or casual markets but the you know the industry absolutely does and the industry knows yeah. you know what those metrics are um and they, so, they have no choice either i mean if they yeah, want to. i mean the i think the esa reported last year that games have passed sports in profitability uh <laughs> Like they, that was, I think, the only thing that was ahead of them in terms of, uh, and I guess the esports market certainly isn't helping um, in that respect. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's such a massive entertainment market at this point that it's you have to, right? I mean, if you're going to be competitive in that space, you know, nobody is going to get into the car market and say we're not going to make cars, we're not going to make trucks, you know, we're only going to make this one or two specialized type of vehicle that maybe two to eight percent of the market is going to be interested in you know that company is going to go out of business very quick unless they have an extremely small and extremely tailored pipeline um which is really when you think about it what a lot of um development studios are right development studios that make these larger scale uh games or that make you know indie games for pc or for consoles or whatever they're small tailored studios for very specific experiences for very specific captive audiences they're not going to be nearly of the scope um that a mobile developer is going to be at yeah uh, yeah and and there's i mean and there's so much money to be made in mobile gaming that it's just so hard to avoid for any any company um i'm i'm well, i was gonna say i'm working i'm not working but i i've done tracks for a video game that's coming up months called monster boy uh for fdg entertainment and uh, before they tackled uh, um, some of the release they had on on switch recently and and that game their their primary uh, type of games at fdg were mobile video games 
because that's what actually allowed them to get the cash flow to get you know on their feet so they could actually work on, on bigger and more expensive games but the the um the bottom line was uh, making mobile video games it's just because uh, yeah. yeah i mean how many how many indie indie companies do you see make a video game and it just be bought or gone or it just um it's, i it's, would say it's you we see kind of three you you see companies that try to make a game and can't get the first one out the door and that's you know there's a fair number of those right um, there are some that don't necessarily have their market figured out and they're able to make a game, but that the game doesn't bring in the capital for them to mm. keep going or discourages them because it's not particularly successful. Um, and then there's the studios that get one successful game out. And as soon as you have one, right, there's sort of this inertia yeah. that comes from developing something successful that pushes you to keep doing it. Um, and now that's obviously the smallest of the three, right? For every studio that catches on and starts making stuff, you know, there's a dozen behind them that didn't. But um, part of that is just the competitive nature of the industry. Part of it is the difficulty of getting noticed, especially if you don't have a marketing budget. Um, and then part of that is, are you developing a game for yourself or are you developing a game for an audience? And <laughs> I find, that's well, it's- a very good point. I find students especially, right? Um, you have to to understand right um, what you what you're really trying to do. Um, a lot of our students come into the program, and we'll we'll do this. I always kind of have this thing. Well, I'll ask them if they have an idea for a game, and inevitably, most if not all of them raise their hands because they have this this idea, something precious that they really really want to make their golden baby, as it were. And I try to give them two options. I say the first option is with your skill level right now, you can try to make that accept whatever quality comes out from making that knowing that you're going to have to do a lot more work to get you know to a certain point and have to sort of be willing to um you know kill the golden baby as it were like to make it knowing that it's not going to be as good as you want to and then move on to the next game that you want to you know make or do something different and the new option that just i guess i'm saying new but how old this is um avatar james cameron yeah um if i understand correctly he wrote that in high school which by like the name unattainium for the metal i kind of believe him you know when he says that and so if you're willing to recognize that like i'm not where i need to be i don't have the money i don't have the resources i don't have the people i care too much about this specific idea yeah to subject it to my current talents and abilities so i'm going to wrap it up you know bubble wrap it put it on the top shelf leave it be and do other stuff for five years 10 years 15 years and then come back and attack this later um if you have that level of discipline if you're willing to kind of hold on to that and do other stuff in the meantime um i find once students are no longer afraid of um witnessing or damaging that idea that sort of dream game that they want to make um once they can get past that using either of those two methods um it knocks a fair amount of the inertia for actually making games out of the way i like that point because it, I, i've done that so many times as well myself for the covers that I do where um, when I started making them at the time I was like there's so many of them I wanted to do but I was I always held back I was like no it, it, there was a few a lot of a lot of them were Turk and stuff or you know but I was like no no I, I need to hold off because if I do them now I'm just gonna not butcher them they, they'll be okay but I don't want them to be just okay I want them to be you know at, at, at a level that I'm I'm, I'm, I'm proud of and uh, yeah, there's a lot of covers I've put aside by a few years because I, I couldn't quite do them. And there's some that I want to do, and I I don't want to do them now either. But that's such an important point for any sort of artistic endeavor as well. Yeah, there's. I mean, it's it's a bravery thing, right? Like it's it's you want to do something badly enough, um, but you aren't capable of doing it. You're you're not likely to to get off the ground. You're not likely to to initiate that. Uh, my thesis uh, when I graduated my master's was on uh, sort of a transmediation of uh, traditional opera and video games. And it was this long form look at Final Fantasy VI. And it's something I'd wanted to write for a very long time. And I ended up spending a year and a half writing it. But I disciplined myself to write 
20 odd academic papers prior to that so that I was really comfortable with the research that goes into it and the writing style and sort of that academic rigor so that by the time I wanted to tackle the thing that sort of was my big thesis topic, the thing that I really had a lot of interesting ideas about, that I had sort of battle hardened the skills that I needed to actually execute on that. Yeah, and it, it's it's inevitable, but it's hard to recognize that you're not yet confident and, and, and confident enough to, uh, to tackle something you really want to do, especially when it's something close to your heart. Do you, do you bring up the topic of things like QA and, uh, and uh, testing? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, my, my favorite question, and I will get this every time, um, I always ask students the first time they submit their midterm game if they had anybody else try their game or play their game where they submitted it. And, and maybe two out of 30 students will raise their hands and be like, yes, yeah, mm. well, let's, you know, oh yeah, because it's, it's not ingrained. You don't, you know, right. they don't think of it as sort of, I need to have this, you know, rigor tested against some, you know, um, baseline they generally assume because they're the creators and because they are sort of authoring this idea that they are capable of handling everything they can do the art they can do the music they can do the design and by virtue of that they can also do the quality assurance and i try you know i try to after that first midterm sort of use that as a way to reinforce like hey like it really does help to get your peers input it helps to get the input of people who don't have a background in, in X, Y, or Z, so that yeah. you can get a, a less biased uh, opinion of whatever you're working on, or um, you know, a more amateur appearance. Like, once you are developing a game, you know, you're already sort of too far in to properly evaluate it from a commercial perspective, right? You're you're already so bought in that um, it really does take fresh eyes to look at something and say, okay. I, I see what you're trying to communicate here. Oh, yeah, your your level design is um, informative enough that I can kind of figure out the game as is. I don't need this character telling me what buttons to hit or what places to go or whatever. And you don't really get that um, when you are so intimately familiar with the experience you're creating. It's in, uh, Q is an interesting topic because, like you said, it's not ingrained even in in people who who will develop or, or project manage uh, 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 video games in this case, but any sort of program. Uh, very recently, I was uh, I was butting heads with a, a, a project manager. Um, it's all resolved now, but the, the the problem I was having was trying to explain to them. I was the um, QA lead. Uh, and trying to explain to them that first you should test your software, uh, you should test it rigorously um, with uh, notes from development, but also you should test it to fail, not to pass. And that's that's always a problem in the, in the software lifecycle management. Um, trying to get to both developers and and management that you need to test to fail first and then test to pass afterwards when you're happy with right. points of failure but it's really really hard to get people to understand that and, and, and games, that's what i meant when i said do you bring this sort of topic up yeah <laughs> yeah oh for sure and games have so many different you know ways to test right yeah. you can obviously have people sitting there actually playing the game and and trying to identify points of failure you know, but then your individual like assets, right? You have unit testing for stuff that you're producing. You might have regression testing that you have to engage in any time the build changes. Um, there's so many different layers to that and kind of getting students familiar with the difference in those and, and how each one works and why each one matters. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, and it's um, it's a pain for management because the, the, it, it, it delays development, it delays sprints, it delays everything and they have to pay extra and yeah it it, it shows yeah. everything up that's it are you, are you familiar with the concept of a dump stat dump stat no okay so uh, in older rpgs your characters might have like strength intelligence charisma wisdom um there's this notion of a dump stat is well my character only does certain things so i can neglect or ignore yeah. this other statistic so like if you're playing a warrior maybe you let your intelligence fall yeah. to like three instead of like 10. <laughs> um a lot of times i think project managers get the sense that qa is their dump stat that they feel like if they invest heavily enough in everything else then it's not going to be buggy and it's yeah. not going to need the, the and it's it's never the case right i i think 
I would hope at least um, at this point we have enough documented evidence from you know decades and decades of doing this stuff that uh, people realize that yeah it's it's it requires as much investment as anything else and certainly um, needs to have something akin to a critical path on the timeline because it is going to something is going to come up and it is going to affect the end you know product. Yeah, if if anything could go wrong then it will it's that kind of mindset you need to have when you're when you especially in software development there's so many moving parts uh, and it, even more so in video games i mean they're in, incredibly complex when you're L literal a, moving parts yeah yeah when you were a kid did you ever thought or hoped or imagined that video games would be so outlandishly amazing these days i'm not sure that i ever daydreamed about the scope of games or just like what they would change into i think um when I was younger, games were a substitute medium for me. I didn't watch a lot of television. I almost never went to the movies. They were, in that sense, my entertainment. And yeah, sometimes they were sometimes they were simple entertainment, right? Something like Marble Madness. And then sometimes they were a substitute for narrative. Uh, they were something I was playing to get some sort of richer story-based experience out of. So in my mind it was always that those experiences were going to get more and more rich maybe in what they can convey that they might tell bigger stories they might tell stories that are more poignant um that they might be eligible for narrative-based awards of some kind um but it was never that the, the scale size the detail of these things would ever kind of blow up as much as it did and now part of that is because um i fell out of playing video games on an extremely regular basis uh, right around the time that CD-based consoles were becoming big, right? Late 90s. Um, uh, me too, actually. Yeah. So, right. So my, my gaming um, as a, you know, daily thing that I was doing um, as, a, as a young, you know, man and as a student uh, largely falls in the 1980s and early 90s. So a lot of it is your perception or scale of what something can be is kind of constricted by that window, okay. like just from a visual perspective. Um, obviously now with hindsight, um, it's kind of, you can see just how the, the scope of this stuff has been exponential. Um, but I think in a way, because that wasn't necessarily what I was getting out of games at the time, there were, you know, I may have had blinders on to that. Yeah, I sort of skipped, I'm, I'm, I'm in a very similar situation, I suppose. I, I sort of skipped that first CD generation cd console generation for me it wasn't exactly uh, um, as appealing as the beautiful 2d games i had before and then suddenly i was looking at this kind of sort of distorted 3d graphics that was neither here nor there it was on, on yeah. only until the end really the last few games of the playstation one um, well in my case i had um i just started playing hockey I had just dropped out of high school and was moving on to college, and I had gotten my first job working at, at a um, at a local retail store uh, that sold board games, role playing games. Like it was sort of a geek mecca, and because I had all these other little you know things taking up my time on a day to day basis, well, I'm, you know, something had to fall by the wayside, and it turns out it was it was you know console gaming. Yeah. Um, yeah, but likewise. I mean, I think a lot of people, especially our age, would probably be in a similar situation. You, you hit. There's always a period where you sort of fall out. You don't necessarily. I mean, you move places. You don't necessarily have your all your consoles with you. It, it took me moving from France to Ireland. Um, it took me a couple of years again to sort of get slowly back into video games, and it was purely by accident. I actually won a PC at work. Um, cause I didn't have, oh, congrats. I had no, I had no, I had no interest. So I, I won it, I think it was 2000 or something like that or, or no, 99. So suddenly I got a bit into gaming slowly and then I eventually got a, a, an old PS one and all my friends were giving me all their games cause they, they moved on to other things. <laughs> so I, I got a stack of games for PS1 for, for nothing. I still have them. You know, they're all here. But um, nice. so I, I discovered the PS1 very late, sort of at the end of the, uh, the its life. Never got yeah. into the PS2 either. Um, but it's only really after the, the 360 and the PS3 that I, I sort of really got back into gaming when I saw 
what video games had become and how amazing Lee crafted like, uh, they really are film level type of productions nowadays oh yeah it's, it's, it's fantastic my return to gaming is a little weird because i never really stopped playing i just played a lot less for a period of time um when i was working on my second bachelor's degree the computer science degree i, I would sit in the um i would sit in the computer labs and i'd be working on whatever program or project i'm working on and we had students who were kind of the first wave students in the game program and they were working on other stuff on other computers and they would sometimes get stuck with the code and I'd walk you know, over and help them out and then I'd go back to what I was doing and then I'd go help them out again and back and forth and back and forth. And before I realized, it's like, you know, the projects they're getting assigned are a lot more fun than the projects I'm getting assigned. <laughs> and so I ended up switching my major from computer science to applied computer science and game design uh, for the last you know, chunk of my, uh, my degree. Um, and then once you're once you're studying games academically, it just it naturally flows that you get super curious and you start digging into everything. Um, actually, the reason I started doing the conventions and started the YouTube channel and all that nonsense was actually because um, of uh, that third major I was working on. I originally had planned to develop videos in house in the university for students to explain. What do we mean by difficulty? What do we mean by parallax scrolling? What do we mean by memory allocation and garbage collection? And just take all these topics and do just real short, like three to five minute videos explaining <clears throat> it. And so I went and bought a couple thousand dollars worth of equipment. The, uh, the department said, oh, by all means, go ahead and uh, start uh, producing videos for this stuff. We'll give you independent study credit for it. Nice. And then the, um, the administration over their heads a month later said, no, you can't actually, you can't actually do that. <laughs> Um, so there I was at the house with all this equipment and nothing to do with it. And my friends say, well, why don't we, why don't we do let's plays and, and showing my age, my response of course is, well, what's a let's play. Um, cause I, this, this entire thing was just so far beyond me at the point. And, you know, we've been doing that for, we're finishing up our third year slash season on the channel. And, and over that time, you know, I have been traveling all over the US. We just did a Portland Retro Gaming Expo for the first time this year. Um, and you, we met at Retro World Expo. And... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Do you, do you go no, there no, as, all... a, as a YouTuber or then as a, as a professor? No, I, I would say it's largely in my capacity as a, a professor at George Mason University. Um, I did have a MAGFest panel for the, the Winter Iron Game Studios channel, but that was, um, there's actually a, a funny story behind that. That was an accident almost. I went into a panel at MAGFest probably, I guess now three or four years ago called How to Get a Panel at MAGFest. <laughs> and, I had, and I had assumed this was learn how to fill out the paperwork, understand what needs to be done. Like this is a primer so that you can then submit and hope to get a panel. Um, Paul, who is kind of the spiritual lead of MAGFest, a few minutes into this thing says, oh, let's just do something fun. Everybody write down their idea for a panel, bring it up here, set it down. We'll let the best three um, make a little five minute presentation to argue why they should get a panel. And so I write down transmediation of games and opera, which is what I'm studying at the time. And Paul's eyes light up like, oh my goodness, what, you know, what is this? And so he picked myself and two others to go up and do this presentation. And I sit there and I'm like, well, my name's Daniel Greenberg. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Georgia. You know, I just start kind of spilling off my CV and what I've been studying. And it occurs to me after I hear the other two panels, which are people saying like, oh, well, you know, I really like Pokemon. And my panel is like why I think I can analyze the Pokemon economy and stuff. And it occurred to me, I probably shouldn't have gone to this thing. And I certainly shouldn't have said what I said when I went there. Um, but long and short of it is I was awarded a panel at MAGFest. And that kind of fell by the wayside a little bit because after I did that uh, event, I discovered Mages, which is the um, MAGFest Educational Symposium, mm -hmm. which I ended up joining. And that's sort of all the people that are there from an academic background who are trying to kind of expand on serious games or games as educational tools or um, games as artifacts from an artistic standpoint or an educational standpoint or a technical standpoint. Um, and I've been doing panels with them and then with Too Many Games, Retro World Expo, uh, Gamer Grays out in Chicago. Um, but when it came time for that first MAGFest to happen, they circled back around to me and said, hey, you won that one panel at MAGFest, what do you want to do? You get the the big ballroom, you know, the, the major room that they had on the first night. Very nice. And I had already, but I'd already given my transmediation of games and opera panel to mages. So 
I grabbed the rest of my buddies, the Winter Ion crew, and we just went out there and we did a little <laughs> one one hour panel called Lessons from Let's Plays, and we talked about our experiences. Um, we had more people in that panel than we had subscribers of the channel at the time. Wow. So, um, you know, I guess stranger than fiction. But yeah, no. Um, as much as I enjoy the channel, it's it's not um, a big commercial anything. We're um, our ambitious four year goal. Um, we are finishing up our third year now. Uh, we have set the goal for year four to get to two hundred fifty six subscribers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. YouTube is hard. I I know. Even when you do well, you don't. Um, yeah, we're facing this Article 13 here in Europe, uh, and the, right, yeah. the uh, CEO of YouTube sort of hinted at the uh, remote possibility of uh, blocking YouTube in Europe um, if this goes into full force. Now, I don't think that's really, really, uh, it's probable, I don't think it's possible, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's looming over our heads at the moment, so it's... Yeah, YouTube's like got yeah. YouTube has a weird um, issue of scale. So yeah, ninety nine percent of yeah, ninety nine percent of what makes Google as successful as it is is it finds ways to provide and automate. Right. Um, if you've ever tried to get your Gmail password back, you'll know that like they will not offer you phone support. They won't offer you tech support. If you can't do it through the online method, then sorry, create a new account. Um, YouTube has such a massive amount of content hitting it that attempting to do human moderation is impossible at this point. So they have to use the algorithms that they use. And for better or worse, that's how we've gotten into some of the problems we've gotten into. Even my channel, which isn't monetized, we've had stuff claimed not just by um, you know, Konami or Nintendo or whatever that content is from. I had, we did a video series on D, um, the Kenji Ito game for 3DO. Uh, that was claimed by a Japanese television show that had themselves done a let's play of that game. So just because we captured it at a certain video quality and a certain size that kind of matched up yeah. with their television production of it, um, you know, they, they claimed the whole series that we did. And, you know, you understand why from a like a technical standpoint that that would happen because they've got you know they trademarked their television show or they you know copyright their television show and so when they get a sort of a content match to a you know a work that they have a license for that it's going to automatically tag that other work um okay. for something like article 13 if you have this unreliable sort of uh, moderation then as the sort of the content owning groups, groups like MPAA, RIAA, you know, these groups that have um, these ownership blocks over this stuff, um, from their perspective, I guess you can understand why the end result of, well, you can't use something that isn't yours combined with we're positive this isn't yours because we don't view it as transformative would kind of give this end result of it's going to be very difficult for this yeah. to continue. But it, um, it goes beyond that because they, they are essentially YouTube is made liable for that video even infringing in the first right place. from a, yeah, the legal. So because right, obviously beyond, you, my videos get demonetized a lot. I, I use crowdfunding for, you know, supporting the channel. That's really sure. the, the best avenue. But for me anyway, but um, it's the fact that YouTube is now suddenly liable for for that issue happening or that demonetization so and they they're going to look at if we are made liable for every possible video that you know has licensing issues or id matching we, we can't obviously do that manually we can we don't want to be held responsible so we just the option would be could be to shut down the operation and uh, yeah i at the same time it's really down to individual countries to implement it a lot of countries are not happy with it either um yeah and it's not in full force yet so let's see what happens i mean i can't see youtube shutting down in no i'm i don't know what the end game looks for like for that i i think you're right it's probably somewhere in between where even if something in that vein gets passed um you're probably going to simply have just more strident um management of the status quo or some sort mm -hmm. of um larger scale you know encouragement to kind of shutter channels that are you know failing whatever these checks youtube has um but 
Google is a massive company and, and their influence in Europe has been hampered very badly by obviously a lot of these privacy yeah. uh, discussions that they've had over the years. Um, but they are still one of the big five and it would not surprise me in the long scheme um, if they find a way to make this work with the EU. Yeah, and even if it somehow gets blocked, I mean, it's a, it's a temporary thing, you know, at the most, really. But it's still there, it's still looming, and it's making a, a lot of us very nervous here in Europe, we're going, well, is that is that the end? <laughs> is that what's going to happen? But, um, yeah, no. let's 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 see. But, yeah, that's just uh, that's just way. It's an interesting time and medium, especially for somebody, I mean, I'm over, I don't know what age you are, I'm over 40, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, people want to watch a 40 year old man play the yeah. banjo on YouTube, which is, baffles me still, but so is the world nowadays, so um, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating uh, medium, and as a musician, it, it has to be the best gig I've ever had, I probably say that at every episode of the podcast, podcast I do, but yeah. uh, it's just been so hard as a musician you know uh, all all my life it, it's hard for 99.9 percent .9 of most artists the, the ones that we hear about are the ones that are lucky but uh, so you having that that platform where suddenly you can um broadcast to everybody in the world is just i mean it's my boggling for somebody my age <laughs> yeah no it's 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 something um in situations like this um, when we talk about like this creative freedom and the ability to kind of express yourself or discover something that you want to tell people. Um, one of my favorite pieces is actually a bit of prose that Robert Frost wrote uh, late in his life. Um, I think in the 19, late 1960s, maybe. Um, in the clearing, uh, when, it's in the, when it's hard to keep from being king when it's in you in this situation. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he essentially says, um, tell Tisiphanes not to mind the Greeks. The kind of freedom um, is the kind they get from politics, forever haranguing for it. Um, the reason artists show so little interest in public freedom is the kind of freedom they've come to appreciate and understand uh, is the freedom of their own material. So never at a loss in simile, they can command the exact affinity of any moment they're confronted with. Uh, this perfect moment of unbafflement when no man's name and no noun's adjective but summons out of nowhere like a genie. We know not what we owe this moment to. It may be wine, much more likely love, possibly well-being in the body, or respite from the thought of rivalry. Uh, it's what my father must have meant by departure, the freedom to flash off into wild connections. Once to have known it, nothing else will do, and our days are spent awaiting its return. And there, there's a reason that that stuck with me uh, so, so tightly is, um, I try to encourage all of my students to have something on them at all times, a pen and paper, uh, a way to digitally record themselves, some sort of way to preserve their creativity, mm. right? They might find themselves in the drive-through and they're gonna order a hamburger and fries and the idea for the best game mechanic they thought of in 10 years just hits them out of nowhere, right? And if they can't get that it down, happens, if they can't- It happens a lot. Oh, it, Right? And musicians are like a hook or yeah. some sort of, of chord, like it, it hits you that you want to try something. And if you don't have a way to save that, and then all of a sudden over the intercom, you say, you know, you hear, uh, is that all? Uh, 10 40 second window. And, you know, you're, it gets pushed. And then that's it. Yeah. And your days are spent awaiting its return. You, you know, when you have to, when you appreciate and understand how fleeting, how beautiful and rare, like that artistic spark of inspiration is. You want to hold on to it. You want to preserve that. YouTube is kind of this unique beast in that it allows curated content and created content to kind of go up and exist uh, in this ether. But I think maybe the most interesting future case of this is the um, sort of as we migrate beyond um, created and more into sort of this spur of the moment stuff i know we have the ability to like stream with twitch and twitch is kind of overtaking youtube in terms of immediate real-time live like popular views but there will be another set of things to follow that up you know and another set of things to follow up and i think as the immediacy of content generation um butts heads with the need to preserve or to curate stuff mm. i'm very curious to see where those two texts merge um, I think we might head to somewhere where you can immediately record this stuff and then stitch it or um, kind of formalize it later. Um, 
I know Patreon has become sort of this necessary landing ground for a lot of people who are are trying to make a career or sort of a business out of this this creativity sphere. Um, I think something that they talked about that interests me a little bit is is how do you bridge the the gap between the created content and the creation of that content, right? Getting people involved with it. When we're making games, we can do behind the scenes. We can talk about like, oh, well, here's unlockable art. Here's, you know, here's a video with like a five minutes behind the scene. Here's developer interviews or commentary and stuff, right? Um, but I think from an online content creation standpoint, um, kind of closing that gap is going to be interesting. And I, I'm curious to see how tech works to close that gap it in a way i mean it, it, there are some artists that do this using patreon already where you know you, you go to their patreon account and if you contribute you you get to see early drafts or behind the scenes or that kind of stuff, that kind of stuff. but it's not yeah it's not tech driven um it's very much yeah it's probably a platform yet to be invented for that kind of S there's your medium. 64 million dollar idea for yeah. <laughs> for those watching and just find a way to close yeah for, for me patron has never been a, a a problem um in in the sense that i i mean it for me it's busking i i've done that you know for years standing in the street with a guitar and just playing and people throw in a dollar or a euro in that case into a, into the basket so i i've done and patreon is very much an online version of that for me but also i always see it as you supporting the process itself not necessarily the end result um, and i think that's that's where it's it's very very important that we understand that the process itself is what drives a lot of artists not necessarily what's at the end you know the for me once a cover is done it's done it's it's of no use or interest to me it's done I, that's it so the, the driving factor for me is the process of putting all that together. Same with the painting. You know, when it's done, I don't stand in front of it looking at it. It's, why would I do that now? Yeah, so, that's that's someone else's job. Yeah, so uh, it's it's the it's the fact that it's uh, you start from a blank page and then the next thing you have this three by three you know uh, piece in somebody's wall. Like it's that it's that driving process that you're supporting with Patreon. So I, I always encourage any other artist to uh, to use it as a medium first because youtube oh, yeah. is just isn't cutting the mustard but also because that's really what sorry that's really what you that's want to promote is your is your process and in a way it's a little more authentic a relationship right yeah i exactly. mean patreon yes, yes. literally is is patronizing the arts if you want to get back to sort of yeah. this you know renaissance era definition of it right um it's one thing to have ad supported revenue from whatever service is providing the video or the content that you're getting from it, right? But Patreon gets so far beyond, well, I'm presenting my stuff on YouTube or I'm presenting my stuff on Twitch, right? You can support people who are doing um, work out, like let's say they're actually doing a theater production out somewhere or they're building an installation, they're doing um, you know, open world art stuff, they have sculpture and concept pieces. Um, you know, the, you have sort of this ability to extricate the process of supporting creators from the method by which they present their creations. And I think that's probably the most powerful thing Patreon offers. Um, it's, it's been something that I've been happy to, to utilize uh, in the, I guess, roughly year and change that I've been uh, patronizing various artists on there. Do you do you have an account for yourself for your your channel at all? Or? We do. Yeah. Um, it's really just to help pay for um, flights because it's expensive yeah. to do right to go out to to you know Oregon yeah. to go up to Connecticut to go around the country. Um, but we do have. Is your channel the, your the third job you mentioned, or is that something? Else? Yeah, no, I, that's what I think of as my third job. Yeah. Is um, so I started to. with I Brian Games. You do. If you as, don't view it that way, yeah. if you don't view it as work, if you don't take it with that level of sort of urgency and um, with that sort of professional attitude, yeah. uh, I think the the end product gets hurt by that. Um, yeah, so we started Wintrying Game Studios a while back. Um, 
The show that we produce on YouTube is called Ion Gaming. Um, we've been doing that for just under three years now. Um, I've actually got episodes of Star Fox 64 and FF4 that I go downstairs and start editing and cutting and producing and getting that stuff ready to put up on the channel soon. Um, but that is the flagship by which we do a lot of our going out across the country and doing panel discussions or going to different events and trying to teach people like, hey, you can make games too. Here's a simple pipeline as to how or you know, here's some useful historical context or some useful um, artistic context by which to view these things. Um, but all of that content um, that we produce is kind of in that vein. Um, we recently moved, actually. Uh, we were based in Clifton, Virginia for a very long time. It's actually a very small town outside of Washington, D.C. that I grew up in. Population is a little over 300. Um, but we moved from Virginia to Maryland this year, and we basically tripled our square footage. So a big kind of hurdle we're dealing with right now is um, like when you were building your your arcade cabinets and kind of you know doing that space out there. We're in this we're in this situation now where I've got all this space and we're trying to build out the library and make sure that the recording studio works correctly and everything's assembled right and you know rewiring everything and reconfiguring everything and getting stuff out of boxes. Um, but where do you find the hours of the day, right? Because yeah. I mean, I'm working I'm working nine to five for the government. And then when I'm done that nine to five, I've got student projects to grade. I've got student homework to go through. I have to, you know, write them emails and go over their projects and discuss stuff with them. And, you know, before you know it, it's, you know, nine or 10 at night and you still wanted to record, you know, with other people who are there with you because there's five of us, you know, on this channel. It's um, Alexandra, Aaron, Richard, Matt, and myself. And, you know, are they available? When can you schedule their time? I mean, we have, you know, group Google calendars and I've got a corporate account with Google just to try to, you know, interact with them and uh, get all that stuff uploaded and backed up and saved and rendered and, um, you know, building a pipeline for creating that content and trying to find the time to actually do the recording and the editing. Um, yeah, it's a lot. I, know I mean, it takes, hours it takes in the day, man, away. right? Hours in the day. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm balancing three channels these days because this is going on a separate channel nowadays. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, and plus a nine to five, plus, I mean, I do a lot of martial arts as well. It's just, uh, <laughs> yeah, hockey is my particular, uh, there you go. Vice, yeah, it's yeah. just every minute counts after a while, literally, uh, quite literally. But, um, I, I, I still have tons of questions. Maybe <laughs> I don't know how, how busy you are. How, you know, I, I've got time. No, I, I was wondering what you make of, um, maybe it is the last topic, what do you make of all this um, retro craze? I mean, you're wearing the uh, Gaming Historian t-shirt there. I nearly wore mine, actually. Um, I'm glad I didn't. Now. It would have been awkward, yeah. Yes. But um, because it's it's been, I mean, it's, it's been quite popular for years. I'm wondering, are we seeing a decline um, at least in YouTube, in, in interest for um, retro stuff. You mentioned Pat Yenius Punk, who's... Yeah. I don't think we're necessarily going to see a decline in interest for retro. I think what we have to compensate for is that retro is a sliding window. Yeah. When you are nostalgic for something, you are nostalgic for something that is roughly a generation behind you, right? About 20 years, right? So... If you look at the NES and SNES classics coming out, they hit a good note because they come out at a point where those who played them in their early years are now in their 30s, have the disposable income, and want to be reminded of that you know time when they were a kid. Um, so now it's 2018. 20 years back is 1998, right? So what is retro isn't 16-bit consoles and it isn't 8-bit stuff, you know? Atari, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Mega Drive, you know, that stuff's beyond retro at this point. That's that's truly, you know, legacy stuff now. Yeah, and there's a NSX. lot of, <laughs> oh, I, I was going to say, not even counting the stuff in other yeah. countries, you know. Um, I had kind of this unique experience growing up where I was exposed to a Commodore 64 and a Speccy and, um, you know, a 2600 and a Coleco all before, you know, I had the chance to play an NES. Um, so I was, you know, almost fortunate in that spec, right? How to get a sense so? of the brand. 
Hmm? How come you actually? Use... Oh, so um, I had neighbors and friends that were all from different backgrounds, and everybody just had one of those things, and it just so happened that the way the neighborhood lined up, right? You know, um, there was a family from France a couple doors down from us. There was a family from um, uh, where were they? Shoot, um, Morocco, I believe, okay. uh, on the other side of the street, right? And then uh, we had the Commodore sixty four because those were actually pretty big in the states. Um, and so it just kind of, you know, it happened that I had that's this interesting, early actually. I was going to ask because that's unusual, even, you know, I, it, it's unusual to have that sort of setup uh, in America, like traditionally it would have been oh, yeah, yeah. Atari NES and then right. whatever else. Yeah. You, yeah. And we didn't, we didn't get an NES until 88, I believe, because right. I think it was about four at the time. Yeah. Well, we were, we had the Commodore 64 and then an Atari 2600. Um, my family wasn't terribly wealthy uh, when I was young, but it actually kind of like from a time perspective got a little lucky because the crash of 83 meant that between really 83 and 85, the North American console market was just a tire fire. Mm. And so we could get Atari 2600 games three for a dollar, you know, so I had a library of games to play when I was young and I could be comfortable with it at an early age because this stuff was just so ubiquitous. Yeah. Um, by the time that we were, um, you know, by 88, you know, the family was much better off and sort of we were in a different circumstance. And then I had access to, you know, a 386 and I could start playing DOS PC games and we got an NES. So I was able to start kind of working on that library. And then a couple years later, the SNES and so, you know, just kind of off from there. But um, I think we forget now that because retro is... GameCube retro is the original Xbox or, you know, the Dreamcast. Yeah. Um, but that's really where that window is now. Uh, the best known content creators, the people that have kind of like that first and second wave uh, YouTube content creation uh, that thrived on older stuff that you, whatever you want to call that content, like retro, um, they're going to do just fine. They've got their audiences. Yeah. But in terms of a growth market, um, it's going to be the people that take that next step in those particular spheres, somebody who can sell themselves as um, reminding you of all the things that happened during the Dreamcast or all the things that went down, like why the PS2 especially, because the PS2 was such a massive success. I, I mean, it's far and away, right. And in South America, in Asia, in North America, in Europe, right? Somebody is going to take that mantle and run with it, and they're going to have a very successful channel because of it. But it's, I don't think it's going to be because someone has a new interesting take on something for the NES or the SNES. I think that particular retro window is coming on. And there's so many now at this stage who, who've tried and, and, and failed, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I can see. That. Yeah, I mean, we we said it earlier with games, right? For every developer that gets a successful title out the door, there's that many more that aren't able to do it, and I'm, it's the exact same with you know any media production. You know, yeah, uh, yeah you have to offer something channel, unique. Yeah. <laughs> now that said, um, uh, as I mentioned, I am writing for for Pat's SNES book, um, and I should hopefully yeah. be done. Yeah, I have the ultimate guide to the SNES, yeah. and I should hopefully be done um, writing for that by the end of this year. Uh, I did, I think, eighty odd titles for it, and I'm working on All another right. uh, batch of those to get to get that out the door. He did almost half of the original NES book and probably nearly killed himself in the process. Yeah. So he's got a, I think, a, a tighter and more active team of writers around this time, where we're kind of taking some of that load off of his shoulders. And, um, I have seen some of the proofs, so I'm really excited to, to see the final version of that book. But I'm also excited to be done the writing for that, as much fun as it's been, um, so I can buy myself a little more time to work on, you know, Winter Island stuff yeah, or, you know, prepping content for the university. A, a while back, you did mention that, yeah, the the, uh, the NES book was too much work for one person there. Um, yeah. And uh, he, had a, yeah, he had a team. Um, Hopefully, hopefully he'll bounce back. Actually, he's, he's been a bit of a, a trouble recently with uh, the stuff he'd, uh, he'd said about Diablo fans. So we'll see. Uh, that's uh, that's he, just the way it is. He's, he's a Jersey kid. He'll be fine. <laughs> I, I've got family. Like my whole father's side of the family is the New York, New Jersey thing. It's, 
don't doubt their resiliency. He'd be, he'd be fine. Yeah, he'd be fine. Exactly. Um, dude, thank you very much for your time. This was super interesting. I, I really enjoyed this. And uh, well, you're more than welcome to come back anytime if you've. Anything oh, you no, it's been about. a blast. I've, uh, I've definitely enjoyed it. But thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we've been chatting for an hour and a half. But people aren't too bored by the time uh, <laughs> the end of this video. But. Um, well, hopefully uh, we'll talk again. Thank you for your time and uh, see. Take it easy. Awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of fun.